welcome to the CMO Spotlight. And I'm here with Kelly Cook, who's the EVP Chief Marketing and IT Officer at David's Bridal. Welcome, Kelly. Thank you, Joe. Glad to be here. Glad, Glad to be here. To Glad you. to talk shop. <laughs> Absolutely. So I wondered if we could just kick off this conversation by your telling us a little bit more about David's Bridal. I mean, many of us are really familiar with the brand. Anybody who's thought about getting married kind of knows the brand. But I wonder if you could just tell us about the company and, you know, how size and shape and what does it do and that kind of thing. Oh, yeah. So we are the uh, largest uh, bridal retailer pretty much in the world. Mm -hmm. um, one out of every three bridal gowns sold in the United States are sold by us. Wow. Uh, we are very, very proud of that stat. We are very um, excited and humbled to be a part of that moment in our life. We take it very seriously and we are constantly focused on driving more and more uh, not only out of the teams, but in strategies and everything we do to deliver more and more for her. Um, we have 300 stores located worldwide, um, and we have a we have you know have an app, and we have uh, digital experiences. We own you know her journey from the even before she gets engaged until after she's married, and uh, on and on with her with her life uh, and the events surrounding her life. So it's an exciting time at the company. Our strategy is to own every dress in her closet and mm -hmm. own every event in her life. So awesome. it's a lofty goal, but we're ready to deliver. So that's that implies that maybe it's not just weddings if you're going to own other. Yes. So there are other occasions beyond weddings that would be appropriate for David's bridal. They are. They are. So we um, we can actually deliver all the dresses that she needs for all the moments in her life. Mm. So we have uh, a, a very large, thriving, exciting occasion dress business right now. Uh, we have fantastic footwear um, that is especially designed to dance all night. Um, you know, we have accessory. Yeah, I love that. I mean, for $29.95, you can have a shoe, literally, you can dance it all night, which is our Aria, our number one selling shoe. Uh, but we want to be there for her for proms, kids and nanas, debutante balls, winter formals, girls' night out, Kentucky Derby. Anytime a, a girl wants to make the world her runway, she needs to pop in and see what we've got going on because it is so fun. And I literally have to stop buying these clothes, Joe. I, my husband is like, you have a, I have a whole closet of just like sequins, beaded gowns. I'm like, you're going to have to give me date night for the next eight, nine years to give me a reason. But it's so much fun and it's so much fun to dress up. And I, I, I think what we're seeing now is, you know, people want to get out and live and do things and yeah. spend money on experiences. Um, we, we have a Pearl report we do every month where we interview, you know, tens of thousands of women, like tens of thousands. And, you know, some of them, we made the comment, like, I think I spent more money on experiences last month than I did food. Mm, yeah. <laughs> you know, they want to feel alive again without the mask or with their families or whatever. So it's a, it's a wonderful, wonderfully exciting time in our business. That's great. And you, <laughs> had, and you said 300 stores worldwide, but I'm guessing the, the, bulk of them are in US and Canada and that's correct okay. yeah and then we have some in UK and we have uh in Mexico and we have JV partners uh in Asia yeah nice. and, and yeah. I, I'm guessing the, the stores are company owned not there's not a franchise model here or something like that there is. We have a franchisee partner and um, partnership in uh, Mexico, a fantastic okay, okay. group, the Romano brothers down there, a wonderful, wonderful uh, family that we have stores in uh, Mexico and surrounding areas. Got it. Yeah. But most, mo the bulk of the stores are owned by David's Bridal and part of, you know, and then yes. I got, it. great. Yeah, yeah. So I I'm curious um, about your role. So I know when you joined the company, you were originally just focused on marketing. You were the EVP and chief marketing officer, and then you added the IT officer to your title. So I'm just curious, what is your overall role there at David's Bridal and, and what does your team look like? Yeah, so that that's a, a pretty yummy question, Joe. I get that, I get that a lot. So when, when COVID hit in March of 20, um, you know, we can, we basically pivot our business to be an e-com company. Yeah. Um, and that allowed us to use our 300 stores as distribution centers and keep our store management team mm. employed and supporting our customers and getting the gowns to them and so forth. 
But as soon as that happened and the stores were closed, and unfortunately we had to, you know, furlough so many of our fellow dream makers out in our stores, uh, Jim, Jim gets really the credit for sort of bringing these two roles together. Jim Markham, the CEO, and he had a, um, a very sort, a very sort of provocative point of view on how he thought IT should deliver according to our transformation plan. Mm -hmm. And his view was, look, I, you know, I can't think of more uh, outputs for IT than either delivering for our customer external or delivering for our internal customer. Those are really the two things that IT should be supremely focused on. And because of that, we were right starting to begin our digital transformation that he had set in place when he arrived at, at David's before, right before I did. And because of the situation that happened with the stores being closed, COVID actually provided us a massive opportunity to expedite a three-year plan into mm. 10 months. Uh, I kind of joke around, uh, you know, we did 10 years of retail in 10 months. We, we delivered 21 solutions uh, in a 10 month period. One of which Joe has completely revolutionized our company mm. and that's our loyalty program. Uh, I can remember when we put out our loyalty program, the marketing trades were sort of making fun of us. Like, mm. what the heck are they think they're doing? The girl's going to get married 32 right, times right, and right. come to David's every are time. Encouraging to, <laughs> are you encouraging exactly. divorce here? Right, right, right. right. No, Joe, that is what they did. If they absolutely did it. And I just, I, you know, we sort of sat back and sort of giggled a little bit. And we were like, just wait and see. There were two things that happened that caused that to, to happen. One was we found out that 62% of women that attend a wedding as a guest, okay, not in it, attend, buy something new to mm. wear. They don't want to wear something in their closet. And I absolutely am in that 62%. <laughs> and we thought, well, wait a second. If, if a bride has a wedding with 300 people, of which 150 of them are probably women, that's half of our attendees, and 62% of them are going to buy something to wear. Why don't we give the bride the credit for all those purchases? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You see? And then the second thing that happened is when we were in the same meeting with my team, we were talking about it. And I said, if we were going to do that, if we were going to give her the credit, not just for her mom's dress, her grandmother's dress, the flower girl dress, the bridesmaid's dresses, mm -hmm. if we could do that, but all these guests... Um, what would we do to blow her mind? And somebody on my team said, well, let's give her the honeymoon for free. The budget is one of the hardest things she's trying to manage. And that is the diamond program. It, in my knowledge, you, you're, you know, you probably get to see a lot of other companies way more than I do, but I don't know of another crowdsource loyalty program in the world. Mm. And that's what this is. And it's like way exceeded our expectations. We're about to cross over 2 million members awesome. and it's not even two years old. And when you get uh, 5,000 points, you get a dollar per point. And when you get 5,000 points, you get a free honeymoon. And we've given away 300 in a year and a half. Wow. Like, so, so it's That's really cool. working. Yeah. Well, and, and that probably required a pretty large IT investment to make that program work. So thus another reason why having IT under the same person as marketing makes maybe some sense. Well, that's, so again, yeah, that's, that's a very astute observation. When Jim put marketing and IT together and that one move, what he did was he completely aligned the prioritization of all the customer driven initiatives and initiatives that align to help support our internal customers. And it, it was it was such a good move. In addition to that, we just started operating our company faster. And what I mean is we didn't have a, a Monday business review meeting with 700 people and 30 decks that were 200 pages long. And when you end the meeting, you're like, who's gonna do what? Like how, who's got the actions? Jim flipped that too. We moved that to executive leadership team meetings Three, three times a week in the mornings at seven. And the first thing we do, we call it living in the ones. 
uh, the first thing we do every morning is read every one star review. Mm. And that that one star review that we're proud, obviously, of the five star reviews. And we I mean, our average is four point eight. So we get a lot of number fives. Right. And we're very proud of those. Um, but the way to really drive the business and deliver something that continually surprises and delights your customers, you've got to figure out where you screw up. And that's what the ones do. So we review ones and then review other aspects of our business. And we just became so agile, like to tweak the business. It just became um, a, a really good sort of leadership approach. So um, it, it's been great. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> I love that. Well, and I'm going to ask you about the journey to, to get to David's bridal in a minute, but to follow on something that you said about the one-star reviews, um, I believe that you have to have those negative reviews to be authentic. And um, I heard somebody get, told me the expression that I love that to make the sweetest cookies, you have to add some salt. You have to add a little salt. Oh, and, I love that. That's and I think awesome. That, I think that, you know, if you go to Amazon or somewhere and you try to buy something and it's all, if they're 15 five-star reviews, you just don't believe it. It's probably just friends and family of the person that manufactured the thing. Whereas if you, if you see a lot of good reviews, to your point, your average is 4.8, which is amazing. Yeah. But if it were 5.0, then it wouldn't be really authentic and believable. Right. And so I, I love that you focus on trying to figure out those one-star reviews, but they're still part of the overall mix, you know. And you have to. I love your saying about the cookie and the salt. That's very wise. We have to, because we, you know, sometimes you can be focused so much on this thing over here that you forget something that's basic, you know? So they're very important to us. And Bob Walker, who runs our stores organization um, and all of the uh, dream makers we out in the field are so passionate about delivering service. You got to remember, this isn't just somebody coming in and why buy white t-shirts and black pants right this person is buying something that is going to be in every single picture they have for the wedding and they're going to look at it for the next 70 years like mm -hmm. so it's it's something we we really treasure um and really strive to exceed their expectations great well so, so i saw you you graduated you got two degrees from tulane uh so we can talk about <laughs> we, we, can, we can talk about new orleans some other time i have i have <laughs> I have a love and passion for that city. Oh, uh, I do too. But uh, after after you're getting your MBA, you you ended up at Continental Airlines for 11 years, and then waste management for three, and then you made the leap into retail when you went to, to DSW. So just tell us quickly about your journey to end up at David's Bridal. Yeah, yeah. So I started out, um, it's funny, the, the movie with Steve Martin called Plane Trains and Automobiles, I kind of yeah, felt right. like that's my career, right. except I went from, you know, planes trash to shoes. Um, yeah, I started out at, at, at uh, Continental, and that was, I uh, started out as a temp in the secretarial pool, because um, huh. they wouldn't hire me because they didn't have any experience. Uh, but, uh, you know, long story short on Continental, that was the first set of roles that I had that fused marketing, brand, data, and technology. Mm. Um, and I'm super, super proud to have had that role because I uh, managed the Enterprise Data Warehouse Project at Continental back in the day when they were on servers and before the cloud, because I'm right, old. Right, right. <laughs> but um, but um, anyway, so that probably brought all that together. And it was a fascinating experience for me because I really started to connect all those. And I use that every day now right? Brand, marketing, data, wow. tech, like that's kind of, you know, come full circle. Um, and I had a wonderful time. And then I went to waste management, which is a totally different environment. Um, you know, 60 to 70% of those are civic contracts. So you're really challenged to think about how do you deliver a superior customer experience? How do you deliver something that makes them want to use you versus have to use you, right? right. And, and then when I left waste management, I had a mentor tell me, uh, he said, you belong in retail. And he goes, and I'll tell you another thing. You're never going to leave it once you get in it. He said, he said, it moves so fast yeah. and you're going to get addicted to that kind of adrenaline. And he's so right because airlines move very slowly. 
trash companies move slower than that, <laughs> you know? And then when I got to DSW, I was like, wow, I really, really love retail, you know, because you're delivering an experience right then and there. And they'll tell you right then and there where you screw up, the customer will, you know? And I, uh, I really love retail. I spent my first five years of my career in retail and uh, Eddie Bauer moved me from New Orleans to Jackson Hole, Wyoming to Atlanta. And then I, oh, I ended up leaving retail after that. But I have a I have a fondness and passion for for retail, based on my, you know, re post college experience. So that's oh, that's, that's awesome. a great brand though. You had some really good experience. That's yeah. really good. Yeah, that's an awesome so, brand. I'm curious if you if there's a piece of advice that you wish you'd gotten early in your career, or maybe it's the advice you would give somebody that's young, kind of starting out in their marketing career. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I guess if, there's so much that I could say to that, um, Joe. The one thing I would say is be brave enough to suck at something new mm. because our world as marketers is changing so fast and you have to have the tenacity, the bravery, the confidence and the conviction to fall flat on your face to try something new. And I would rather fall on my face than my butt. If I'm falling on my face, at least I'm moving forward. If mm. I'm falling on my butt, I'm going backwards. And I think, you know, as you, as a leader, as you, you know, motivate and inspire and set visions to teams, you have to create an environment where it is okay to make mistakes mm -hmm. and it's okay to try something new. Um, when I was at DSW, I created something called the, the CLM Awards, and it stood for Career Limiting Move, mm -hmm. <laughs> and it was a play on making mistakes, because what I found is after a few years of us, it seemed like everything we were touching was working, working, working. I got the sense that we were starting to get safe a little and yeah. like not taking chances and, and putting ourselves out there, and I think that's you know, I, I wouldn't say it's a universe display of success. I wouldn't go that far, but it was definitely a little bit of a pivot from where we had been. And so I set up these CLM awards and I said, this is about rewarding mistakes. This is about learning from them and getting better. And I can remember <laughs> the day after we launched it, a guy that worked for me named Scott came in. I think he was manager of uh, email marketing. He came in and he said, um, you know that whole uh, CLM thing that you launched yesterday? And I'm like, oh, yeah. He goes, well, I think I might win it this year. <laughs> and I'm like, what? I'm like, this sounds awesome. What happened? And he goes, well, you know that uh, offer that we agreed to send out, you know, to customers, which was the $50 off offer? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he goes, well, I just sent a $50 off, $50 purchase to seven and a half million people. <laughs> and I was like, I was like, oh, that's a good one. <laughs> you know, but you know what? Here's the thing, Joe. Yes, we made the mistake. Yes, we had to recover. Yes, we had to fix it. But when you peel the onion back, the reason why the teams had gotten together to put that email out in the first place was because we had seen some data from the previous weekend that if we pivoted our offer quickly, um, we could get higher incrementality. So they went out of process to fast track an email, right? Which usually the process is, you know, five yeah. days. They did it in 24 hours. So in their effort to do the right thing for the business, you know, we made a mistake, but that to me is what you have to do as a leader. You got to make it okay to try things, mm -hmm. you know, and reward them when they try to do things for the business. So those are, I mean, I have a lot of fun CLM stories, but Scott's is my favorite. I, I, he was such a, he had such a great attitude about it too. It was so awesome. I love that. You, I love that you gave him the space and the, the cover to be able to come forward and, 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 you know, admit to that major mistake and not not feel like he was on the hot seat and, you know of course you try to limit those kinds of mistakes and you try to yeah keep them doing them twice but at the very least you gave him this the, the grace to say it's okay that you made a mistake let's you know 
figure out what we need to do to fix it now. Oh yeah, we 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 did. We fixed it. I think I made one right after that. I made a big one, and I thought I, you know it was very uncomfortable, but I'm glad I did it because I you know I wanted the team to know the boss could screw up too. Yeah. You know, and I yeah. make you know hundreds of mistakes every day, and I am very vocal about them to my team because I want them to know it's okay to say that. Yeah, that's that's great. Yeah. So I, I believe everybody has a superpower, and I'm curious what you feel your superpower. <laughs> You know, it's funny. I saw that in the notes and I thought it was kind of yummy that you put that in there. I actually asked a few people on my team. I said, if you were yeah. going to define that for me, what would you what would you say it was? And I got so many different answers. And I'm like, well, that's weird. I don't think I want to say a bunch of a different answers. Um, but but the the uh, highlight, I guess, and the summary is fun, focused, and fearless. That those were like, that's probably out of all the feedback I get on myself from my team. Those are the three words that come to mind and they're not always good. You know, <laughs> like I said, yeah, you know, I think every superpower has an evil twin, right. uh, you know, just, yeah, every, every superpower has an evil twin. And I think you have to, you know, manage those things appropriately, but, um, my, you know, it's funny, my, uh, we did uh, Gallup Strength Finders uh, and my, we have quarterly QBRs or the QBRs, quarterly business reviews with my senior team. And we did uh, Gallup Strength Finders and my, my number one strength is learner. Hmm. And, and I think, I think that is a very sort of underrated, underexposed, uh, incredibly important trait in leadership these days. I really do because the world's changing so fast, Joe. We're having to pivot so fast all the time. And, you know, there's a new app every day that kids are on and you got to get on it. Like you're I'm right. on B, I'm on B real now. Like there's just like all these things that you're just on it all the time. So uh, it's good. Uh, I think that that curiosity is crucial for marketers and, you know, it keeps us, on the pulse of what's going on with our consumers, which is super important. Yes, so, so true. Um, are there certain values that you, you sort of explained your superpower in context of values. Are there certain <laughs> values that, that you demand from your team though? Like uh, if, if somebody were to work on your team, are there certain things they would have to have as values? They would, they, I mean, th and these are sort of my personal leadership values, not our brand values because they're different. But in my view, I have, I have three. One is don't pee on my boots and tell me it's raining. <laughs> Be a straight shooter. To me, communication and our ability to communicate effectively together, whether it's risk or reward or strategy or whatever it is, be a straight shooter. I'd much rather have that than anything else. Right. It's just being able to effectively communicate. The second thing, and this is just my approach, and sometimes it you know, makes people uncomfortable, but I'd rather get the board out of our own eye before the, we get the splitter out of somebody else's. Mm. And what I mean by that is, you know, marketing is not a standalone sport. It is a team sport. IT is a team sport. Um, the story that marketing tells about the brand and the experience of your yeah. brand are like this now. And the experience of our company affects and interacts with every single person in the company. They're not siloed anymore. And day-to-day -day stuff happens, communication will break down, a project goes off the rails, somebody didn't know something, whatever it is, Joe, stuff happens all the time, right? Mm -hmm. We're humans, we make mistakes. Um, but going back to creating that environment where it's okay to talk about risk, you know, I, I, I would rather approach a problem. What could we have done better? What could our team done better? What could, what process could we have improved versus pointing the finger across to another department and saying they screwed up and blah, blah, blah. I just, I would rather sort of fix our own shop. And then we go to a partner and say, yeah, this thing sort of is off the rails a little bit. Here's what I've discovered. Here's what we're going to do better next time. And sometimes you don't even mention what they could have done better. And mm -hmm. it comes up anyway, right? It's a, it's a nuance, but it's incredibly important to me that we think and act that way as partners. And then the third thing is I really, really value servant's heart mentality. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you make somebody else a hero? Um, you know, how do you make the customer the hero? When we screw up, how do we make how do we make it right? Um, how do you build succession plans? So employees want to stay. Uh, how do you build um, 
new projects that employees can be a part of because they have a dream to go off and start their own company someday. How do you help them do that? I, it's a very sort of giving approach. And to me, I found um, in my experience that that is a very fruitful and rewarding way to lead. Mm -hmm. I love that. I think that's great. Um, I'm, so as you may know, at Setup, we're focused on connecting brands and agencies together. We live in that space between brands and agencies. We, um, our, our, our purpose is to unlock human connections, the power of human connections. But we do that by matchmaking, being marketing matchmakers. But because we don't, we're not an agency, we're not a brand, we live in that space between, we often think about that relationship. So I'm just curious, generally, either at David's Bridal or even in a previous life, how do you work with agencies? Yeah, so that that's such a great question. I, I have a, I, a very specific point of view, Joe, on how I think about that. Um, unfortunately, um, in my career, I have observed uh, a lot of inefficient spend mm. with, with agencies, AORs, that sort of thing. I typically shy away from any retainer-based kinds of programs um, for lots of reasons. One, I need, I need flexibility because the world's changing so much. Mm -hmm. Two, there's a new problem every day to solve. Three, I, 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 you know, I want to partner with uh, companies that I can trust, mm -hmm. you know, and, um, and, and not, you know, not say I can't pick up the phone call because that's not in my scope or whatever it is, you know, and so there has to be a, some give and take in the trust there. And the way, the way I approach agencies is uh, there are a small handful of, of people that I have worked with over the years that I absolutely trust 100%. I trust them and their way to lead the teams that can help me solve the problems, to help us solve the problems. Um, I trust their ability to understand something that we're trying to achieve as the brand because the agencies work with lots of different brands, yeah, with right. lots of risks that eat those, you know, and so to be able to do that. And what I found most beneficial, and I still do this today, is I segment the problem I'm trying to solve and I try to go out and find the best partner that can help me solve that particular problem. Mm -hmm. The only asterisk is, you know, this year coming up in 23 will be the first time that I will actually put a small agency on retainer mm -hmm. uh, because they they completely delivered for us in a way this year that exceeded my expectations and that doesn't happen very often. And so um, we are going to put them on retainer, but I, I, I would rather be very specific about the problem and go find the best person out there to help me than trying to make one agency the expert in everything sure. that I need. It's just not the way it is, I think, in these days. Yeah. Well, to, to your point about retainer, I think the value of a retainer, particularly with this agency that you really trust and know well, is that you know that then you have a consistent group of people that are going to be thinking about and working on your business on an ongoing basis versus the spinning a team up for a project, they do the project, then they go off and they work on other things and then maybe you have to hire them back for another project. At least, you know, you'll have some consistency in terms of the um, institutional knowledge that they'll build up over time working with you. That's right. And you're, and that's a really, really good point. There's, you know, there's good things and bad things about the approach I take, you know, by not having a broader agency that's thinking about bigger ideas and bigger things for us, I may lose a little bit of that sort of, uh, sort of, uh, you know, innovative forward and thinking um, sort of solutions. But, you know, when I look out at the next 24 months at what we're doing at David's Bridal, um, you know, I'm feeling really good and passionate about the plan that we've laid down as an executive team. And I, in looking at that plan, know that we're going to need a lot of help along the way to help us get yeah. there. And to me, that's more executional and operational in nature versus a strategic roadmap. And so I feel like the, the, the approach we have now is good. Um, you know, I've got the small retainer I'm going to do. It's a company basically out of uh, Nashville, who's, I think, tremendous. 
And then we have a small agency who we have that works on pitches and PR for us, but these are very small retainers, yeah, right, right, but, right. but I do, you know, I go out like Laura Manis, who uh, I think she runs uh, uh, group M now mm. CEO of that. I mean, she's one of the people on my list. Like she, I trust her, trust her judgment. And she's done a lot of one-off projects for me over the years. Jason Peterson out of Chicago has done a lot of work for me. Uh, and so I'm really, um, proud and thankful and grateful to have those kinds of relationships with people where they can help us out when we need it. They're usually quick and nimble and agile, which is usually what we need at the time. <laughs> Great. Are there certain disciplines or functions within marketing that you feel we could benefit greatly from getting outside perspective outside of our four walls? And are there certain other things that you feel we need to really own this internally and would never outsource that discipline or function? That's yeah. You, you, I think you may be the first person that ever ever asked me that. That's such a great question. Yeah, I do. I do have a point of view on that. I, I don't think we need to outsource creative, creative strategy, artistic expression, copy, um, you know, photography, uh, copywriting, anything like that. I, our team is absolutely, absolutely tremendous. Mm. And and by the way, Joe, we don't hire models at David's Bridal. Everybody that you see in our marketing is either employee or employee, family, or friend. No mm. model. Well, hold on. I hire lingerie models because that would be weird to know that the girl in accounting is doing lingerie. <laughs> <laughs> okay. oh, that's, the, <laughs> that's the only models I hire. You need stunt doubles for the lingerie. <laughs> that would be weird. Yeah, stunt doubles. I love it. So I hire lingerie models. That's it. Uh, but everybody else's employees and families and friends and think about the kind of talent that I would need in creative to turn an untrained, basically an untrained actor into a model. Right? Yeah. And so Brian, who runs creative for me and Juan, our photography and Pia, who runs visual, like they're so good at making you feel uncomfortable. And this is the girl that, you know, is a merchandise assistant. I mean, if you go to our homepage right now, the girl on the homepage is a merchant. <laughs> I mean, and she's damn gorgeous like it's so say, does this mean that david's bridal only hires beautiful people because you, know, <laughs> you need them you need them to be models for you that's right well of course they're all beautiful all my fellow dream makers are beautiful um so i don't think i would ever hire that i i don't feel like um the you know the specific strategies of social media i feel really good about that we have a young lady named katie stankovitz that uh, runs that for us. I, she does a tremendous job. The entire social team is great. The the, the areas that I, I think that we need outside perspective on, and I'm actually, you know, sort of in the market right now trying to find that solution, is the, the intersection between, you know, go google local and then performance max and the inflation strategy inflation problems we're having right now promotional shifts tagging seo you know there it, the the interconnection between all those things not only changes every day but yeah. there is a balance that has to be maintained all the time to stay efficient our team is so focused on running the day-to-day -day and hourly business. I think I need somebody on the outside command to help us yeah. with that perspective. Somebody that lives in that world every day and they, they're monitoring changes in Google algorithms and they're Correct. monitoring price, changes in pricing strategy and things like that, that maybe, you know, your, your, your team is focused on being retailers, not you know, uh, uh, marketing, um, digital savants, right? Right. Yeah. Right. That's exact. That is absolutely right. Joe, you said it perfectly. So I'm actually looking for that right now. I'm we, yeah. we need some help because our, our internal folks are busting their tails, uh, you know, trying to deliver the results for the business and we need a, and I can't, you know, I need somebody to come in and help us with a point of view, not trying to get the, the media buy business. Like that's the weird like balance. I want somebody to help us like overall assess everything, not mm -hmm. just come in and say, I'm, you know, I'm trying to take your media business from somebody else. You know, those kinds of things you got to think through. But um, so I'm looking at that right now. I think, you know, we've got some good data scientists within the organization. There's always more questions and then we have resources to answer. So you know, tools and solutions that help us get to the data and mine, you know, easier, more efficiently, faster. 
Um, we're looking at that too, but the other one is the most important right now. Uh, oh, that's great. Um, but that's hard. You're right. That to find the balance of understanding our business and helping us be better retailers, but also understanding all of those external tools and variables. And, and um, you know, I think that's one of the things that maybe uh, is a benefit of an agency because they work on businesses in different industries and, and across different, you know, platforms, they sometimes bring insight that you wouldn't get if you were, you just worked with somebody that only knew retail, you know, or, or bridal, you know. Correct. I, I think that's right. Well, I told my team, I remember telling them, I said, when, when uh, I had read years ago that NASCAR was trying to shave off seconds in the pit, Right. That was they they were trying to shave off seconds in the bit and their teams observed brain surgery in hospital in a hospital mm. while there's so many people simultaneously working on a patient with the you know with the highest de degree of risk that there is, which is you know spine and brain and how they moved together to help and support each other. That's an example that you're making right there. It's a completely different industry, but you could learn something from it. Yeah, I'm I'm all for that mm -hmm. approach. I think that's smart. I'm curious if there's a program or a campaign, either at Davis Bridal or maybe or maybe in one of your previous lives, that taught you a huge amount, either because it was a huge flop and you learned some valuable lesson. <laughs> you just needed to learn that lesson, or it was a big success and you'd like to try to emulate that in some way in the future. Oh, wow. Good question. Well, there's, there's a, there's definitely a lot of flops out there. Uh, I guess if, if I had to pick one, um, so I ran Kmart for a while, uh, for Eddie Lambert and Chicago. And when I got there, uh, I remember being told, uh, you know, we don't have a digital savvy customer. Um, <laughs> You know, they they care about a paper circular in the newspaper. They're not digitally savvy. Uh, the household income is low. Um, they sort of live paycheck to paycheck. It was just a sort of, um, it was a very, how do I describe it? was It was, um, this is what it is. It's not sort of ever going to be. Like they were resigned to this is. Who yeah. Is. yeah. Yeah. That's very well said. Exactly. And I remember you know, we did some research and did, you know, talk to thousands of customers and we discovered some beautiful things about our customers. Mm -hmm. One is over half of them have multi-generations living in their home, mm -hmm. which is awesome, right? Yeah. Kids, parents, and grandparents. Two, two thirds of them were multicultural. So multiple languages were being spoken in the home. Three, they weren't digitally savvy from the perspective that they didn't buy computers, but they spent their money on phones. They mm -hmm. were they were absolutely digitally savvy. And the the fourth thing, and this even just saying it out loud, it still gives me chills. And this was the thing that we learned that set the path that changed our trajectory. It was by far at a 90% rate, the parents that we spoke with said the only thing they care about is they want their kids to have a better life than they had. Mm. And we were like, wow, 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 wow. So we set a strategy in place with the ethos that life is ridiculously awesome. We launched a coupon app. We had 620,000 downloads in 60 days without wow. any paid media. Wow. We, yeah, we, you know, um, we went out and bought off price name brand uh, clothing so their children could wear Nike, Adidas, mm -hmm. Under Armour, Supreme. Mm -hmm. like, and they bought these shirts for $8, Joe, mm -hmm. $9, right? And uh, we had, you know, uh, presidents of all of our categories. We had a weird sort of org structure, but the presidents of the categories actually reported into Eddie. And, but we all sat down on the table and said, what are these like loss leader things that we can do mm -hmm. to 
fulfill that, I want them to have a better life. A name brand, right? We went out and created a, a shoe that sort of felt a lot, it was inspired a lot by the Air Jordan, but didn't have the price tag, but it made the kids feel like, wow, I've got mm -hmm. something that is spectacular. And it was a phenomenal it, it is a phenomenal campaign and, and, and company strategy because it united, it reignited the workforce around serving this customer and providing an experience that made them feel like they were giving their, their kids something different. We went on um, that cable show, oh my God, I can't think of it right now, that, that does the, the uh, um, that does the uh, automobiles that they create from scratch. I can't think of it. My friend Fred's going to kill me for it. Oh, I, can't right, 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 right. I can't think of the name. Anyway, we made a we made a uh, augmented reality bus that we took all over the country and the kid we'd park it in the parking lots and the kids would come in and play augmented reality games which they didn't have access to at home and they could take the videos of them playing and share it with their families mm. and friends on social media right so it was like those kinds of things were just um incredibly exciting uh for us and it, it meant something to all of us because we were we were touching on something that was such a higher moral effort which was to yeah. give them something that they that they didn't have and give that to their children so um it was a really exciting uh opportunity that's great i mean who who knew that um kmart in this case had a higher purpose beyond just selling you inexpensive stuff i mean it was it, it was a it was a it was a purpose that you all were fulfilling and serving a real deep down need for the, the your audience so that's great I right think, uh, west coast customs sorry west coast customs that's the name of the tv show oh, <laughs> i was like uh, it's ryan i was like oh ryan i can see his face yeah west coast customs, west coast that's customs a, the show yeah, absolutely. yeah. That's the show. all right so i have some questions for you just for fun yes yeah, yeah, yeah. Question. so the first is is there a band or a movie or a quote or a book or a sports team that really inspires you and what is it about that thing that inspires you most oh that's that's very 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 easy it is my favorite quote of all time by teddy roosevelt called the critic i have it here on the wall yes I, it's on my wall too <laughs> i also it's... have it out here in, in, in our larger part of our office um it, about the man in the arena and, the man in the arena yeah. marred by blood and dust and yes and sweat yes it's not the That's, critic who counts it's, it's not, not the, the critic, critic who counts. counts not that it's the doer of good deeds yeah that is my all-time so it wasn't it's not technically a movie but uh i i read a lot of uh, biographies and autobiographies because i've gone back to learning i love learning from people all kinds of people from all kinds of walks of life and teddy roosevelt and winston churchill are probably two of my favorite ben franklin's probably a close third um but when my my favorite quote of winston churchill is he was in the house of commons debating this young lady and she was just getting so mad at winston churchill she was just getting so freaking frustrated with him uh because he wouldn't he wouldn't uh, acquiesce to her point of view and she finally said oh my gosh winston if you were my husband i'd poison your tea and he looks at her and goes if you were my wife i'd drink it <laughs> like, so amazing. I just I love I, he's one like you think of people you'd want to meet like if they could come back to life uh Teddy's one Ben's one and Winston's one I'd love that's to do awesome. dinner with those guys that's awesome that'd be quite a dinner party um, <laughs> yeah you would I would without even saying anything just watching the three of them interact <laughs> yeah no lie uh, but of course they probably wouldn't even understand a word that each other said <laughs> probably <laughs> Uh, okay, so outside of your family, what's your biggest joy in, you know, outside of work? I mean, do you have a, a hobby or passion? Playing the drums. Oh, wow. What kind play, of drum, drum set? Playing the drum set, yes. Yeah, I, I can play everything by the Rolling Stones and nothing by Metallica, which tells you how bad I am. So I play with a lot of passion, but there's something about, I love music. I, I love music. I love all kinds of music. And I love playing the drums against music. So, it brings so me Charlie along. Watts is better than uh, Ringo? <laughs> They're probably about the same, I would say. <laughs> 
but I, I love, love I love it. I love, it. It. I love playing the drums. Is there is there a band a band a brand that you've never worked on that you really admire, and what is it that you admire most about the brand? Yes, there's two of them. Deleuze Trading Company. I just think everything they do is good. I, I just, I love them. They inspire me that, you know, they do commercials without, you know, reality. They're all cartoons and drawn. They're talking about men's boxer briefs and they make it funny. I just, they have a good product. My sons and my husband ask for their, their boxer briefs every Christmas. Um, but I just think they do a good, the shopping experience is good. They're friendly. The culture is good. I admire them from afar. I just, I, I really, really love them. And then the second one is a small little tiny brand out of Dallas called uh, Hippie Cowgirl uh, Couture. Um, I love that. It's a little tiny brand that sells turquoise, but she is so good at explaining her product because she'll have necklaces for $50 to 5,000 and they all look like turquoise and she explains it, but the owner does all her own content. She wears yeah. all the product all the time. Like she's completely, oh. she is the brand. And I just, I think it's a really fun, um, she does a really good job explaining the brand. She's authentic. She's real. She's funny. Uh, she, I just think she does an incredible job. That's, that's amazing. I, you know, it's, tough to be an entrepreneur. It's even tougher to be a one, one woman band that does everything. Yeah. She's, she's pretty, she's pretty, uh, she's pretty amazing. I'm impressed by her a lot. Okay. So my, my last question for you is, is there a fictional story or realm that you'd want to live in? And well, why would you want to live in that realm? Oh my God. Yes. Harry Potter. I want to be Harry Potter's teacher at Hogwarts talking at Leah. Yes. That's what I would want to do. <laughs> so, so for what? what? Which house? Which house would you be in? Oh, I don't know. I don't know if I can answer that. I, I don't know. I because uh, that it's a debate with my kids. We have five kids, and they're all like Harry Potter freaks. You know, I think my daughter actually has the lightning bolt tattooed on her on her hand. Like they're hardcore. They go to Disney. They go to that. You know, uh, Universal. Uh, Universal. They go to Universal. Sorry, the Universal every year. No, it's it's fun. Like we watch the show. Like it's it's fun. It. I just think it's such a uh, it, it, fantasy. It's just it's fun and magic. I just thought it would be a, a I fun love it. thing. Well, Kelly, I can't tell you what a, an amazing thrill this has been to have this <laughs> conversation. So, so Kelly Cook is the EVP Chief Marketing and IT Officer for David's Bridal. Thank you so much, Kelly. This has been such a joy. You're welcome. Have fun, Joe. I'll, I'll talk to you soon. Thank you for uh, for having us.